Hey there, this is Yash Verma, your host and travel guide to the universe's majesty. Welcome to the first video on Wyverse, as we delve right into what happened at the very beginning of time. You may have heard that when you look at a star at night, you're actually seeing light that was put out tens of millions of years ago. It took that long for the light to get from its location to Earth. There are signs of our long ago past everywhere, you just need to know where to look and how. One of the most important goals of particle physics is to use this evidence to figure out how we got here. Scientists have used experiments and observations to look into our past as far back as a second after the Big Bang. At that point, the stardust that makes up everything started to come together. But what happened before that changed the way the universe is now, and it may even show how it will end someday. Scientists who study particles are trying to figure out what happened in that very first second. Right after the Big Bang, the universe was a hot, dense soup of particles like Higgs bosons, quarks, and what we now call dark matter. It started to get bigger and cooler. As a result, the Higgs field as we know it kicked in and gave mass to the very first elementary particles. Quarks and gluons started to stick together to make protons and neutrons, which then started to stick together to make nuclei. Even though we can't go back in time and study the early universe in person, Scientists have been able to look back pretty far, almost to that very first second. Astrophysicists can take us back more than 13 billion years, to just about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which is part of the way there. They use powerful telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope to study the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, which is a pattern of full thermal light that was imprinted on the sky when the first neutral atoms started to form out of the dense particle soup of the early universe. Particle physicists have used other ways to look even further back in time. Experiments at large particle colliders, for example, have already given us some limited information about the time before the CMB even formed, all the way back to the very first second of the Big Bang. Even though things were different right after the Big Bang, the laws of physics were still the same. So the large collider experiments can tell us about those early times. Today's laws just have different effects at different levels of energy. Both the relativistic heavy ion collider at New York's Brookhaven National Laboratory and the Large Hadron Collider at Europe's CERN smash particles together at very high speeds. Even though these energies are not high enough to recreate the Big Bang, and probably never will be, they do resemble some parts of the early universe, which can tell us about how it was. Experiments at both of these colliders, for example, have shown that quarks, which are usually stuck together very tightly, can get loose under the right conditions. If quarks are freed when there's a lot of energy, then they were also freed when our universe was just beginning. Experiments that look at large particles made in particle accelerators have also given physicists information about the early universe. They have found that some types of particles change into matter more often than their antiparticles change into antimatter. This is called decay. This break in the symmetry between matter and antimatter gives us a hint about what happened when the universe was young when matter and antimatter should have been equal. Several important questions could be answered if we knew what happened in that very first second. Are all the known forces that govern how particles of matter interact really just that different parts of the same force? And what happened to all of the antimatter that should have been around right after the Big Bang? The answer to that first question could tell us something new about how the world works. Scientists think that the laws of physics as we see them today might be simpler than they seem because of experiments they have done in the past. This thought has been growing for a while. Isaac Newton made it very easy to understand how the world works by figuring out that the force that makes apples fall is the same force that keeps the earth moving in a circle around the sun. Hans Christian Oersted did the same thing when he saw that an electric current could move the needle on his compass. Electromagnetism is now thought of as one of the four fundamental forces along with the strong nuclear force which holds atoms together, the weak nuclear force which makes the sun shine, and then gravity. But it's possible that some or all of these things started out as a single force that broke up in that very first fraction of a microsecond after the Big Bang. When scientists extrapolate what they know about how strong the different forces are at different energies, they find a point less than a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang where all the forces except gravity are equal. String theory, which says that all point-like particles are actually one-dimensional strings, could show how to add gravity to this single force. If we knew how the forces interact with each other, 
we might have a better idea of how things work now and where they will go in the future. What happened to all of the antimatter is the second most important question scientists have about the very first second. From what we know about the laws of nature and what we've been able to see, the Big Bang should have made about the same number of matter and antimatter particles. When matter and antimatter meet, however, they destroy each other. In a universe where everything is 50-50, no structure should have been able to grow. Matter and antimatter should have cancelled each other out, leaving only pure energy. But matter kept on living, and it's almost impossible to find the antimatter in our universe. Physicists want to know what happened if the unified force broke up and matter beat antimatter in that very first second. All of the energy in the universe came from the Big Bang, and that hasn't changed. The types of particles, however, we have seen have changed. To make a particle, you have to turn energy into matter. And the more energy it takes to make a particle, the more mass it has. When the universe was much smaller, and all of its energy was concentrated in a smaller area, it can make particles that are much bigger than the ones that we see now. In fact, we can see of the universe right now is only the lightest particles from the last three generations. Knowing this, it might seem impossible that we could ever figure out what the first second of the universe was like. But here's the surprise. All of those heavier particles still exist, but they're hidden in a virtual layer underneath everything we see, like radio frequencies that are sent out that even our most sophisticated radio systems cannot pick up. Scientists now know that every particle is actually a ripple of energy in a field. A proton is a ripple in a field of protons, an electron is a ripple in a field of electrons, and so on. Massive particles that were around in the early universe might not be around anymore, but their fields are, and so is the chance that those particles will show up. The fields of all the particles that have ever been all around us. Scientists have already found a few different varieties of massive particles, but theories about a single force and the difference between matter and antimatter suggest that there are even more. Some scientists think that the neutrinos with a lot of mass exist, which could have caused the antimatter matter imbalance. Some people think that every particle we already know has a partner particle. There are a few ways for physicists to look for heavy particles. First, they use accelerators to make enough energy to get them out of hiding. This is how particle accelerators like the LHC are used to study particle physics. When particles with a lot of energy hit each other, their energy can turn into mass for a short time, sometimes in the form of these particles. But this can't be done because of how much energy a particle accelerator can make. Another way to find massive particles is to look for them in a roundabout way. Scientists use accelerators to make a lot of these particles so they can watch out for these effects. They can find signs of interference from a hidden particle by carefully measuring a certain type of decay or interaction. Some theories say that protons, which are the building blocks in the center of every atom, will eventually decay. Don't worry, this terrible process would destroy our atoms in at least a billion trillion trillion years. Scientists won't have to wait that long though to catch one decay. The only way to figure out a particle's half-life is to use probability. For example, if you have 10 atoms with a half-life of 24 hours, you will probably only have 5 atoms left by the end of the day. But the 5 atoms you lost did not all break down at the same time. One could have gone bad in just a second, while another could have taken 23 hours. The same is true for protons. We just don't have the right tools at the moment to see if there are any breaking down. Current and planned experiments will look at more than a billion trillion trillion protons and detectors deep underground to try to catch the extremely rare decay of this particle with a half-life of at least 10 to the power of 34 years, which is number one, followed by 34 zeros. Let that sink in. Finding proton decay would be a strong sign that theories about the unification of forces and the difference between matter and antimatter are right. Other patterns in the sky besides the CMB could also give physicists clues about the very first second. Before the CMB was even created, charged particles made the universe look cloudy. Light was stuck in that cosmic suit, and if it moved even a short distance, it would hit a charged particle and bounce back. As particles came together to form neutral atoms, the universe eventually cooled down and became clear. We now call that light that got away CMB. 
Scientists who use methods based on light have not been able to see further back than that point. However, the neutrino is smart enough that it should have been able to get through that haze. Since neutrinos don't interact with matter very often, they wouldn't have been taken up by other particles in the dense universe before the CMB. If physicists could look at patterns in neutrinos from the early universe, they could even look further back in time. Scientists are trying to figure out how to do this, but they haven't found a good way to do so yet. In gravitational waves, physicists also hope to find patterns from the beginning of time. Like the CMB, gravitational waves, which are thought to be ripples in space-time made when a large object moves, should show what the universe looked like in the past. Because these waves wouldn't have been affected by the early universe's cloudiness, this map would give a glimpse into the very first moments, as early as 10 to the power of negative 36 seconds after the Big Bang. That is a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, also referred to as the Planck time. Researchers have made detectors that are very sensitive to look for gravitational waves, but they haven't found any yet. To figure out what happened in the very first second of the universe, both theorists and experimenters need to work together. Theorists come up with models and figure out what they predict. Experimenters come up with ways to test these predictions, and theorists and experimenters work together to look at the results together. In the years to come, scientists will use particle accelerators and accurate measurements to look for the massive particles that theories about the first second after the Big Bang say there should be. They will use very sensitive detectors to find out more about neutrinos. This could in turn lead to discovery of particles heavier still hidden cousins which are thought to have caused the imbalance between matter and antimatter. They will look for patterns like the ones in the cosmic microwave background that neutrinos or gravitational waves might have made when the early universe was expanding. And they will look for things like proton decay that their theories say should happen. At the end of the day, it's not enough to just think about where we came from. Answering questions about where we came from helps us understand how the universe works and where it's going in the future. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to give it a quick like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell icon if you want to watch more content. My next project is going to be a video on the multiverse, so stay tuned if you want to see that and let me know down in the comments below what other content you would like to see next. Again, this is your host Yash Verma from Yverse, and welcome as we take a journey towards everything amazing about space in the universe.